I'm an engineer. I love dance. I've always looked at those huge pieces of infrastructure as a sort of artistic expression of engineering. Large dams are tremendous feats of engineering powers. They do provide water and energy. They shield us from floods and droughts, and they have improved the life of countless people around the world. On the other hand, they do require significant investments, and they might cause relevant social and environmental impacts. Regardless of pros and cons, I feel I've been lucky enough during my career to be involved in projects in important river catchments uh, with huge dams and reservoirs. For rivers such as uh, Tigris and Euphrates in Iraq or the Eastwood in China. But more recently, there's a project that has completely turned upside down my perspective about dams. It's a project meant to provide water supply solutions to rural communities in the dry lands of Somalia, targeting the construction of small, low-cost and low-tech infrastructure rather than relying on bigger reservoirs. And it's a project where water and sand mix together to prove they are both essential for the daily life of people. It all started in 2016 in Somaliland and Puntland, which are two regions in the northeastern corner of the Horn of Africa where communities rely mainly on shallow wells to gather water, but such technology proved to be not cost-effective. So we assessed the potential to store the water in small seasonal river valleys called wadis, using a centuries-old technology known as sand dams. A sand dam is basically a two meters high wall which is built across the river valley. When the rainfall comes, the water, together with uh, sand and other sediments, is trapped by this wall. And the sand gradually fills the area behind it, creating a sort of groundwater system where the water can then be pumped out with a well. And since the water is protected, is behind the sand, evaporation is minimal. And the sand acts also like a filter, cleaning the water as it trickles through. But this beautifully simple system does more than provide water. The groundwater aquifer it creates spreads moisture in the surroundings, allowing trees and plants to flourish. The more the plants, the healthier the soil, and the more other issues such as soil erosion are reduced, creating a virtual cycle of biodiversity, water, and soil conservation. Once it's built, a sand dam can last up to 50 years and it requires very low maintenance. Such a technology has been historically practiced by the people living in the Horn of Africa, who understood how to manage and to deal with the natural slopes of the valleys and the rainfall to create water sources that can be used during the dry periods. But unfortunately, this traditional knowledge has been lost in the last century, as more and more villages turn to alternatives, like wells. The communities living in the Horn of Africa and in its drylands mainly rely on small farming and of livestock breeding. Many of them are still today nomadic shepherds, who follow ancient tracks in the sand with their camels in search for water and for pasture lands. Well, you can imagine how difficult is the life of those communities. And we, when we studied the project, we immediately realized that we had to proceed very carefully in trying to introduce a new water point in order not to disrupt the delicate balance that those communities have created with the natural environment. So before we started any engineering works with the sand dams, we collected information on the ground, interviewing communities to understand their needs, to know whether they want or not a sand dam or whether they are ready to maintain and to manage it once it is built. Well, the data we collected was shocking. Many of the project sites do not have a reliable water source during dry periods. And in order to survive, they had to pay water from water trucks, or they have to send 
women and kids hours away from home just to fetch water. Learning such information, I stopped breathing. And to be honest, I had a mixed feeling. I felt obviously very bad for those people, but I felt relieved I do not have to endure such hardships just to get water. Everybody knows that rural communities have less access to services, but to me, looking at facts and figures written on paper made everything suddenly more real. The moment I realized and understood my privilege was kind of a revelation for me. And I still keep on my desk in my office the diplomatic bag where we received the paper questionnaires from the communities so that I do not forget the goal of my career, to bring water to people. After the initial phases of the project were successful, we went from the initial eight sites in the north to over 100 water points all over Somalia. So I had the chance to visit multiple times the region and the local communities. Traveling in Somali drylands means spending hours in a hot four-wheel drive track, breathing dust and exhaust, bumping along a goat track that somebody decided was a road. The landscape is amazing, dominated by sand and scattered vegetation. There is no sign, any landmark whatsoever, and it is incredible. Sometimes you can find few houses along those roads. Those are the houses of the nomadic people, precisely designed to be dismantled, packed on the back of the camels, and built somewhere else. The first time I visited the village, we arrived in the morning, and the chief of the community invited us in a wooden hut they were using as a common room. First thing, they offered us black spicy tea with camel milk and fried liver. This is the typical Somali breakfast. Afterwards, we started talking. And we talked about the project that we designed that was ongoing close to their community. They raised a few issues. They didn't understand the shape of the dam and the few families were worried that uh, the project could negatively impact their lands. In order to better understand their issues, we all went to the project site where the construction works were stopped due to the, con to the concerns of the communities. Once there, suddenly, I became the one who was supposed to provide solutions and answers to 20 so many men and women that were now just standing in front of me. I felt I was back again at the university. I explained the project as much as I could, uh, but I could tell my words were not enough. I needed an image. So I took a wooden stick and I started drawing sketches in the sand, showing the shape of the dam and pointing with my wooden stick at the temporary lake that the water would create. When I finished my sandy sketches, everybody was smiling at me. The farmers had finally understood the engineers and they allowed the project to continue. So we headed back to the village and we were invited for lunch with the elders. As honored guests, we were offered with a top menu, spaghetti, goat meat, to be eaten by hand, sitting on a carpet. This is the Somali style. The lunch was such an inspirational moment and it strengthened the connection we had with the community. We talked about uh, their farms and their livestock, their crops, and how their life becomes impossible when the water dries up. I could barely understand and almost feel the difficulties and the emotions they have during those hard seasons. After lunch, we got another black spicy tea, a few pictures with the cameras, and I left with the hope that our project could make a real difference. The project is still ongoing. We are still working with local geologists to find the best sites, talking with communities to understand their relationship to water, and designing the best sand dams we can. Now, in its seven years, we feel we can declare the project a success. Those small dams are not just feasible. They do offer a low-cost way to achieving clean water. Based on local knowledge, 
with almost no maintenance costs and low impact. All communities have experienced several spillover effects with improvements in the soil and vegetation conditions in the surrounding areas. And in addition to that, being involved since the beginning of the entire process, they have developed a strong sense of ownership. The entire approach is currently being adapted to other countries in the Horn of Africa region, like Kenya. I like to think we have helped communities of varied environment breathe again during the dry and hot seasons they face. And to me, the project meant a lot, both personally and professionally. I do remember very well the first time I visited a sand dam right after its construction was completed. I was so excited. But such a feeling is nothing compared to the incredible emotion I had when I visited the same exact site one year later, and I could see vegetation, water, and lots of farms. And I finally realized that our project is really making a difference for local communities. Generally speaking, the people I met and the experience on the ground have radically changed my perspective about water management and the roles the dam can play. I'm still an engineer, unfortunately for my wife, I have to say. But I still love huge infrastructures. But at the same time, I'm inspired by the approach of so many people of finding locally tailored, low-cost and low-tech solutions for water harvesting. I see there is a potential to export the entire approach, not only in the Horn of Africa, and any water system might benefit from the use of a network of small dams, decentralized dams, combined when it is needed with a bigger central infrastructure. The world should be inspired by the resilience of Somali people. A little bit of Somali style in natural resources management or in investment strategies might help shaping the improvement we all want to achieve and the flexibility we need to stand successfully climate crisis.